Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our Bedlam community discussion hosted by the Institute for the Development of Human Arts. My name is Jessie Roth. I am the director of IDA. I want to say I use the pronoun she, her, hers, and I want to kick things off by doing a visual description of myself. I am a white femme presenting woman, and I have brown hair. My hair is in a bun on top of my head, and I'm sitting in front of a green plant behind me um, with some natural light coming in through the window. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. This evening, I'm going to show a couple of quick slides to tell you about Ida and this event we're having, and then you'll hear from our wonderful panelists. So really briefly, the Institute for the Development of Human Arts, for folks who might not be familiar, um, we're a community of mental health service users and survivors, psychiatrists, psychologists, and other clinicians, as well as activists and artists. Um, and we've all come together with a common goal of transforming mental health care. And what we do here at IDA is we advance critical, effective, and scalable alternatives to mental health through a combination of collaborative education as well as community development. And what really makes us unique here at IDA is the way that we integrate experiential knowledge with academic knowledge, which means to um, challenge the idea that only those who work in the field of mental health are the experts. And this really helps to shift uh, power dynamics in a system that we find uh, privileges professional experience. And there is an image on the screen. The description of that is one of our board members, a man named Angel Serrano, is presenting at a peer conference to a room full of people. So why are we here this evening for this discussion? Um, we have a few goals for this event. Uh, the first is to reclaim our history. We also wanna foster critical dialogue and we wanna propose a vision for the future that's informed by lived experience and grounded in rights and social justice. And I wanna mention for folks who might not know that uh, last week Ida wrote a letter to PBS about the Bedlam documentary that we are really honored to uh, be standing with more than now 85 mental health, disability, and social, social justice organizations um, calling for the publicly funded media entity to center and amplify the voices of survivors, ex-patients, and people with lived experience of the mental health system. So thanks so much to everybody who shared this letter um, over the past week. We're, we're really excited about the, the reach that it's had. I wanna do some quick community agreements for the event. This applies to our panelists who you'll be hearing from shortly, as well as to anybody who's using the chat, which you can feel free to use to ask questions and share insights. Um, the first of our agreements is shared expertise and wisdom. So everybody brings their own expertise to the conversation. We can all gain from and respect each other's various expertise. The second agreement is that overcoming oppression aids everybody's liberation. It is our responsibility to challenge various forms of prejudice. We educate in the spirit of solidarity and hold each other accountable without criticizing who they are as people. And finally, we listen like allies. We respect a wide diversity of choices and perspectives, even when we disagree, and we don't judge or invalidate other people's experiences. So really quickly, I'm gonna talk for just another minute and then I'm gonna pass it over to Sasha, who's gonna share some insights on the film and also our moderator for the evening. You'll hear from each of our panelists who are gonna introduce themselves and from there, we're gonna dive into the panel discussion. The way that's gonna work is we have some questions we're gonna ask folks um, and then we're gonna intersperse that with audience Q&A. So feel free to type your questions as they come up for you. We'll keep an eye on the chat. Um, we'll take a break in between and then we'll uh, finish up with the last half of our Q&A. So on uh, accessibility, we have a couple of things this evening that I wanna go over. The first is closed captioning. We have closed captioning available, and if it's not visible to you, you should have um, in your screen controls a button that says closed captions. Be sure to hit that, and if you're having any issues with it, um, give us a shout in the chat and we'll try to help you. Second is we have two ASL interpreters joining us today. They will be swapping out midway through the event. As soon as I um, stop sharing my screen, we'll give them a second to uh, do their visual descriptions as well. And speaking of, um, whenever possible, we will aim to provide visual descriptions. This means descriptions of our panelists when they introduce themselves and reintroducing by name when somebody is responding to a question. So very lastly, we are recording this event to share with our registrants later on. 
We have two people handling tech support. Um, thank you, Pauline and Jasmine. And if you have any issues, you can write to them in the chat. Uh, so yeah, lastly, use that chat for Q&A. We probably won't get to everything this evening, but we will save the questions and we hope to engage with them uh, in an ongoing basis. So with that, I think yes, I'm see, it going seems that some back. people can't see the interpreter. I don't know if that's a problem. Mm, thank you so much for mentioning that. Is that still the case for folks? Okay. Somebody says they can see everyone. I think I'm gonna pass it to Sasha and then we're gonna we're gonna take a look and make sure. Yeah, make sure that you have gallery view on as a participant in order to um, in order, order to see everybody. Great. Some folks can. Thank you for mentioning that, Andrew. Actually, before Sasha, Andrew, do you want to give a quick visual description of yourself? The interpreter, Andrew, uh, uh, a white masculine presenting person with a blue shirt and a black background. Okay, we're in. All right, y'all. Hey, okay, so. Um, Thank you, Jesse. And um, I just, I just want to welcome everyone. My name is Sasha Altman de Bruel, and I use he and him pronouns. I'm a white middle-aged man. Um, and behind me are shelves of books with a bunch of years of my written journals. Um, I'm here in Oakland, California. It is a super honor to moderate this panel. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited about it. I, I, right off the bat, I just want to say how grateful I am to Patty Byrne from Sins and Valid. Um, for helping us at IDA become more attuned to the disability community um, and how to figure out how to create more accessible events. We're, we're, we're in the process of figuring it out. Um, it's been a learning curve, but a much appreciated one. Um, unfortunately, Patty's not feeling well and couldn't make it tonight, but she is definitely here in spirit and we love you, Patty. Um, mad love and respect to all my fellow IDA core team members, Jesse, Jasmine, and Pauline, who work really hard and have a lot of vision and drive. Um, and we, we learn a lot from each other. I also would like to thank our board of directors. I know a bunch of you out there watching tonight um, and the ever-growing community of folks who help, help keep us on track and inspired. A big part of what makes IDA powerful is that our membership and core groups are very intentionally made up of service users, family members, and clinicians who wanna see a new direction for the mental health system and the way our society thinks about how we take care of each other. Um, and it's it, like having, having that mix, that, that ability to hold complexity, even if we don't always um, see eye to eye, is there's a lot of power there. Um, I wanna thank everyone out there watching this program to know, I, wa I, wa I want you all to know that the people who developed this program that you're watching tonight are really driven by love and a sense of justice for the most marginalized in this society. Um, and that there's so many people's voices that are left out of the dominant narrative of mental health. And tonight we're, we're attempting to represent a few of them. Um, we made the decision to target this film, Bedlam, because it's a great example of a kind of very slick propaganda that looks like it's being woke when its underlying politics are actually quite regressive. Um, the idea that mental illness is primarily caused by biological brain disease is a very dangerous worldview to have at a time when we're watching our country rapidly devolve economically and socially. It's a little too convenient for the people who are in power to blame the individual chemical imbalances in our heads for our suffering and all the people out on the street. That's really the core of, of, of my message that I want, I, I want to get across is that we're, it's really important that we keep, that we stop talking about mental illness as if it's some biological brain thing when it so clearly has to do with the, um, the world around us. I think that we all agree that Bedlam is an important film because it portrays how broken our current mental health system is, but it ignores that poverty and racism and systemic oppression are enormous factors in what cause mental illness. It sounds harsh to say, but I'm dead serious. The best way to deceive people is to tell them the truth, but not tell them the whole story. While well-intentioned, 
Bedlam is a very deceptive film asking to be called out. I personally am diagnosed with a serious mental illness and I've spent a bunch of time being forcefully medicated and in and out of psychiatric hospitals and jails. Thankfully, it's been a, it's been a long time since those days. And, but I actually spent a month of my life in LA County Jail, which is the, the film that's, you know, th this film spends quite a bit of its energy in Los Angeles. Um, and I spent a month getting shot up with Haldol in a, in a jail cell there. The only portrayals of people like me in the film, people who are diagnosed with serious mental illness, are in acute crisis. And it makes it seem like the obvious conclusion is that we need more forced treatment and hospital beds rather than actually putting resources into housing and education and all the things that keep us healthy and mentally secure. I want you to know that we, the, the, the people who, you know, at Ida um, and the folks on this panel, I mean, the, 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 um, those of us who had a hand in writing the letter that, that went out to PBS um, and like all the people behind the scenes who watched the film and gave feedback, um, that we actually really enjoyed the process of, of putting this event together. Um, and that having the opportunity co to connect with more than 80 organizations has been a really powerful reminder that we're not alone. And that although we're, we're a, a marginalized voice at this point um, in the story, that it's looking like there's gonna be a shift if we do our work right. So I just wanna say that um, I'm, like I said, I'm super honored to, to be leading this panel and we have amazing people on this panel who um, are gonna bring perspectives that I think are gonna really help um, inform the, the discussion about Bedlam. I also wanna say that right at this very moment that we're recording this live, that there's another conversation happening about Bedlam with the directors of the film that's being hosted by Fountain House in New York City. Um, and and our, our friend and, and fellow um, Ida member, Issa Ibrahim is on the panel. And he's on the panel with like, you know, the directors and like, and, and a bunch of other folks. And he's the only one who, who's really a, you know, who, who's a survivor of the mental health system. And, uh, I just want to send love and solidarity to you, Issa Ibrahim, and just know that, like, you know, all our voices tonight are, are with you, and hopefully you'll be joining us later, later on in the broadcast. Um, so all that said, I, I, want to, I, I, I want us to get started, and I'm just, like, super honored. Um, I, you know, I just had the chance to, to, to meet Aza Alterafi, but, you know, I've, I've been reading her writing, and we're you know, super grateful to, to have her here. So um, I'm gonna pass it to Aza um, and, and we're, gonna, we're gonna move on to our introduction. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Sasha. And thanks everyone who's played a role in making this happen. I am Aza, I use she, her pronouns and they, them pronouns. I am a black femme presenting person. I'm wearing a floral print hijab. Um, and a dark green blouse. And behind me is the gallery wall that I have with a Power to the People poster and images of Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali visible behind me. Um, and I am a mad person. I am someone who spent many years cycling in and out of psychiatric institutions. Um, I am a disability policy researcher and disability justice advocate and community organizer based in the colony of Virginia. Um, and I just wanted to quickly share my reflections on the film as well. Um, the first thing that I want to say is it was extraordinarily painful to watch. Um, not only for all of the voices that it erased and not only for the ways that it um, mis misrepresented uh, much of the underlying causes of the systemic harm, abuse, and violence that uh, were exacted on the people um, that were featured in the film. But I also want to emphasize that not only was it deeply sanist, right, in its portrayals of uh, mental illness, quote unquote, but it's also deeply anti-Black. It was deeply violent. It was deeply capitalistic. It really served to reify every single oppressive construct. And in so doing, really then um, 
worked to support the state um, in its project of settler colonization, in its project of exerting carceral control over um, vulnerable and historically marginalized populations. So when I watched it, it wasn't simply the pain and agony and re-traumatization of seeing the violence that I, some of which I've myself experienced, but it was also the fear that this was legitimizing a centuries old project to exert control and to extract violently labor um, from, from black indigenous historically marginalized groups and people who have the label of mental illness assigned to them. Um, so my hope is that through this conversation, we can unpack that and really sharpen our analysis of how these intersecting systems of oppression play out both in this film and also in our advocacy and movement work writ large. Thank you so much, Aza. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it on to Leah Harris. Thank you so much, Sasha. Um, <clears throat> my name is Leah Harris. L E A H H A R R I S. My pronouns are she, uh, her, they, them. Uh, I am a white, uh, middle-aged. Oh yeah, uh, femish. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry. femish uh, presenting person. I have short wavy hair that's kind of half dark brown, half rose gold, and I'm sitting in my home office with books on a bookshelf behind me. The wall is orange, my shirt is green. I don't even know how to describe my sweater, but it has a lot of animal print on it. I also uh, live uh, in the colony of Virginia here in the uh, settler colonial US. My positionality and my relationship to this land is that I'm the descendant of refugees fleeing anti-Semitic violence in what is now Poland and Russia over a hundred years ago. My family uh, and myself has benefited from white privilege over the past century that we've lived here on Turtle Island. And I work uh, to disrupt and dismantle settler colonialism and white supremacy as an anti-racist, anti-Zionist, Jewish, queer, mad person. Uh, joining the fight for collective liberation led by Black, Indigenous, and people of color. I'm a writer, I'm a parent, I'm a psychiatric survivor, ex-patient, mad person who navigates non-consensus realities and altered states of consciousness at times. Uh, for work, uh, I'm a correspondent with Mad in America, which is a webzine focusing on science, psychiatry, and social justice. Uh, my website is L-E-A-H-I-D-A h-a-r-r-i-s dot com and you can learn more about my work uh, and read my writing. So how this documentary landed with me, sorry my heart is pounding even when I think about this documentary and I'm just going to take a breath. I've watched this documentary so many times because I reported on it for Mad in America. And there was a piece that just came out today. It's on the front page at madinamerica.com. I also covered uh, as part of that story, they did an event, uh, the filmmakers on March 3rd in Capitol Hill, right before COVID hit. And they showed a kind of 40 minute curated sneak preview version uh, from members of Congress and various power players in DC. It was an almost all white room talking about quote criminal justice and I felt physically sick being in this room just like I feel physically sick remembering it now. The film contained enough of my lived experience to land with me viscerally. Um, the scenes in the film, I won't go into detail describing them, but I just as I am now I kept forgetting to breathe during the course of that film. Um, because it was it's so personal to me. I first got into the mental health system at the age of seven, got my first diagnoses, my first pathologizing of experience, and spent my adolescence in and out of systems. I was also born to two people who were diagnosed with, quote, serious mental illness as young adults. A relative told me after I was grown that my parents met in the asylum. Nobody can confirm or deny this because they're both gone like many, many people impacted by psychiatric and other forms of oppression, um, they're no longer with us. So it just landed with me in this way because the material is so intensely personal uh, and political. 
a big part of my struggle for my entire life has been reclaiming my narrative from psychiatrists and doctors who told me what I was and labeled me and diagnosed me. And so to see once again, a white psychiatrist in full entitlement and power and privilege to take it upon himself to tell these stories with a complete lack of humility, to hear this person call to bring back the asylum and to see the way the public is congratulating this, when psychiatrists have had a literal stranglehold on this narrative all along. Well, how does it land with me? It's rough, thanks for asking. <laughs> In terms of the voices, real quick, that have been left out of the movie, uh, first, anyone who has a critical or even creative perspective, um, you know, so, so much of the case is that we've been fighting to reclaim our history and come up with our own ideas and supports and innovations. And that's not to, to speak negatively of the people in the film or their experience, but I'm talking about what the message that is underlying the film. There's people who, uh, oh, I said, we've been fighting to reclaim our history and come up with our own ideas and supports and innovations. And there are people who criticize the film's thesis for good reason, based on data and based on history. And so they just create and shape this narrative that as Sasha says, contains only part of the truth. But when we don't actually get to hear people narrating their own truth in their own words unfiltered by a psychiatrist's questions and we hear from not a single critic as if this is all unassailable truth so um, i'm going to leave it there for now but i'm um, really uh, looking forward to the dialogue and conversation yeah yeah we'll be back more leah harris for sure let's pass it on to akeem akeem browder hi everyone can you uh, can i am i heard yeah I uh, want to thank everyone for uh, taking part of this uh, very important conversation. Uh, my name is Akeem Browder. I uh, respond to him, her, I, sorry, excuse me, him, he, uh, and basically you could just call me Akeem Browder or Akeem. Um, I live here in New York City, the Bronx, and uh, currently I'm in my house in the comfort of my uh, confined uh, my confinement in New York uh, within my house in my living room with my background uh, reminding me of the uh, important story that happened uh, to my brother Khalif Browder while I wear uh, and represent uh, Khalif uh, his uh, his name uh, on my shirt a white shirt with black letters K-A-L-I-E-F uh, I also started the Khalif Browder Foundation <clears throat> as a mental health uh, and crisis intervention organization uh, to combat the uh, trauma that is uh, what we call and identify as uh, urban trauma in, uh, in the States. We have a multi-generational um, uh, multi uh, toxic stress in our urban settings, um, which we find in historical, biological, and environmental um, backgrounds in New York. And we combat um, these issues uh, that's found in uh, our communities and our truth, uh, youth in the black and brown community uh, by identifying their urban trauma, which is identified by six characteristic uh, traits, anger, perpetual error, mistrust, manipulation, fear, and rejection. Uh, my work with the youth and young adults is to say that basically the, uh, we're ignored and uh, either we're diagnosed with um, uh, uh, what I would call a false, uh, a false diagnosis instead of understanding what our kids and our youth and our community uh, from an urban setting uh, uh, is forced into um, or forced to live, uh, live with, uh, we don't get um, uh, proper treatment. We get misdiagnosed, mistreated, and uh, mishandled. Or mis uh, and uh, and underrepresented. Uh, after watching uh, this uh, film Bet on Bedlam, uh, which is why we're here to talk to you, uh, and after watching it, I gotta say the the feeling that I get from it was horrific. It, if you haven't seen it, please understand that this is heavily influenced uh, with medication uh, that is pushed onto patients whether forced or not, or forced or acceptable, uh, or, or um, uh, understanding 
what the long-term effects is going to be. Uh, and even if they do uh, don't want it, it's forced on you. It's something that I, I, I feel like uh, the government is with this video, or this, this documentary is making sure that you, as is said already, that you'll get that one-sided view as though it's the full perspective um, when there's much more to be said. Not that uh, anyone has to go through the system to understand, but those with the lived experience can also, which you have already heard, can speak towards it, uh, towards the violence that's um, given while in these facilities. Uh, I think we have to do and come together as a body of people to understand the narrative has to change between what in our community or what in our circumstances, in our upbringings, um, uh, give us these lifestyles that is then thrown away because the government just does not want to deal with uh, the real problem. Uh, we can't, I, in my opinion, we can't put a mask over uh, everything and uh, that mask being a medicinal purpose when there are conditions in our environment that causes PTSD, that causes um, trauma, and then you're just inflicting more by throwing us in these facilities like jail, uh, what they did with Khalif, being that he wasn't uh, uh, pre, uh, that he didn't have any pre-existing conditions or trauma uh, or PTSD or anything, but the environment that he was in causes uh, caused it, uh, his, his trauma and his condition. So I'm, I'm going to leave it there. I, I hope that we, uh, my hope for this uh, panel and conversation is that it extends past this conversation uh, with uh, reaching out to PBS uh, or even the um, us on here and actually become active in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Akeem. Yeah, grateful you're here. You're a powerful voice. I'm, I'm going to pass it on to Felix Guzman. Welcome, Felix. Hello, so my name is Felix Guzman. I go by Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, loud and clear, man. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so my name is Felix Guzman. I go by he, him. Uh, I'm a poet, organizer, peer specialist, and psychiatric survivor. Um, trauma permitting, currently facilitating debate classes at Rikers Island with the Rikers Debate Project a proud member of Vocal New York, Coalition for the Homeless, Fortune Society, Community Access, and countless orga other organizations organizing around ending mass incarceration, ending homelessness, uh, harm reduction, um, and uh, uh, I forget the rest, but uh, I was recently appointed to the New York City Council's Commission on Community Investment in the Closure of Rikers Island. So um, part of a coalition that is to um, dedicate and direct uh, monies from the closure of Rikers Island into the communities to reinvest and actually uh, further decarcerate and try to prevent. Uh, also a member of the Department of Mental Health and Hygiene, so a Consumer Advisory Board, and uh, just overall a uh, survivor of many broken systems. Um, I entered the mental health system when I was uh, not sober uh, back in the early 2000s. And as a result of um, that lifestyle led me to incarceration and enter entering the mental health system there. And um, that was uh, an experience that, um, yeah, Rikers Island really should be closed. Um, the nature of uh, trauma that uh, is around, that was inflicted, that uh, can't be forgotten, um, it's, it's, it's madness. And um, uh, fast forward a few years, um, coming home from prison, I was on work release, and unfortunately, there was a situation where um, I had a panic attack, and because there was no no non non law enforcement um, number to call, police came. Uh, as I was on work release, I wasn't wanting to come to be sent back to Rikers, and I um, I attempted to uh, take my life because I didn't want to continue to be impacted by trauma in that manner. Um, and for that reason, um, there's a situation in life where people try to minimize trauma by giving a diagnosis or try to minimize what you're going through when the level of indignity, the level of um, the lack of compassion, the lack of just uh, integrity that um, is removed from you when you're in these systems where you have to 
uh, basically be a pawn to whoever's um, power play is that, that day's role. And um, this film, uh, this film didn't actually showcase the survivors at all going forward. They didn't showcase the changes, the, um, the community investments that, that could have been made that um, could have redirected people from entering the mental health system or actually exiting homelessness if they were homeless. I think that uh, this film tries to present just one narrative, but um, I, speaking for myself as a formerly homeless person, to be medicated uh, and to be homeless, it's a re recipe for disaster. So I think we have to really start looking at the uh, root causes of how people would be entering the, re the mental health system and try to look for preventative measures. Let's, let's um, start bringing out more alternative medicines, alternative treatments, you know, start teaching people about, uh, you know, EFT, you know, um, uh, sound manipulation and uh, so forth. There's so much more that unfortunately you have to enter the system and be told along the way what's available as opposed to at the very beginning. And you kind of have that autonomy removed from you. So, you know, it's a, uh, it's a very unforgiving system. And at times, um, the only way to exit is to um, basically not answer the phone, <laughs> you know, not, uh, not communicate with people. And um, that's the only way sometimes to actually push, push your personal narrative as your lived experience. And, you know, um, for me, it's a, it's a situation where um, what is on record on paper is not the representation of me. And um, when you go to try and challenge that, um, there's all kinds of inconsistencies, all kinds of misrepresentations, all kinds of lies. And that is something that represents you for seven to 10 years. Imagine um, your life being reduced to papers. You know, I experienced the brutality of Rikers Island, you know, of homelessness, of, of uh, oh man, like the situations that um, I endure as a result of that have me in a lot of self-care and unfortunately, that is the nature of how some people are living their lives right now. And we have to actually just look at that, the nature of violence that comes with forced medication and coercive treatment, the ability to not say no or be given an alternative, you know, be given a choice, be given informed consent. That's something that we need to actually address is being aware um, of what side effects are and given choices because having no memory, sleeping 12 to 13 hours a day, you know, always hungry. Imagine that being homeless. Imagine that in the, in the grips of trauma, trying to figure out how to navigate that. And you can't navigate that because for, for something like that to be healthy, you have to be rooted in a stable environment. And with that being said, I think that, um, that this, film, um, this film needs to actually start addressing what's pro the problems that are in the communities and start looking at uh, preventing traumas I started putting some violence interrupters, some gun and uh, gun violence interrupters out there. I started actually bringing out um, less medical model uh, guidance counselors in the schools. You know, let's let's uh, try to actually have um, just defer, defer, defer before um, that becomes a a norm. Because once you once you uh, take something, you know, like it's crazy to get off of it. Felix, thank you so much. I'm, like, I'm, I'm super. I'm super looking forward to hearing more from you on this panel. Um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna pass. I'm gonna pass our first question um, to Aza. And so the question for you, Aza, is: How did you understand? How did you understand this film, Bedlam, in terms of disability justice and representation of disability communities? So this film is extraordinarily ableist, but I want to kind of zero in on some of the some of the elements of this film that I think really speak to the disability, the need for the disability justice framework. 
For those who are unfamiliar, first I want to name and honor um, those who actually first articulated this framework. Um, Patty Byrne, who is going to be present with us today and who we are sending healing wishes to. Um, and in conversation and in movement building with people like Mia Mingus and Leroy Moore and Leah Lakshmi and other organizers and disabled, queer, predominantly women of color who were in other movement spaces and recognized that in other spaces, there was a consistent failure to integrate an analysis of ableism in their movement work. And similarly, within disability spaces, it overwhelmingly uh, focused on the experiences of white people, generally of white men, and typically of only certain categories of disability, specifically with more focus on people with physical apparent disabilities. And one of the things that I found really fascinating is the disability justice framework seeks to correct that by really emphasizing the need for intersectional analysis, the need to understand and uplift cross movement building and cross disability solidarity. And in the film, there's this moment where a psychiatrist is speaking at a conference for the National Alliance on Mental Illness and the people who are gathered talk about how if we just treat people with mental illness the same way we treat people with physical illness, we'd, we'd be able to address this issue. Poof, it would kind of disappear, right? And I found that to be extremely fascinating because what it's doing is it's positioning the oppression experienced by people who receive uh, mental illness labels as being somehow um, something that exists in opposition to the systemic oppression that is faced by people with physical disabilities, which at once is erasing people who live at the intersection. And it's also really doing the work of the state and trying to pit marginalized communities and identities against one another in a way that keeps our movements fragmented and really undercuts our ability to walk and move towards our collective liberation and towards justice. And within the context of this film in particular, I found it really disturbing because at its core, what ableism is doing is it is dictating which body minds um, are valuable, are productive, and are worth saving, and which ones are harmful, are deviant, potentially dangerous, and don't produce and therefore are disposable. So to put it simply, it creates a norm and then measures body minds against that mythical created norm in ways that advance the state's interest. And so to have a film that is perpetuating these ideas of people with these psychiatric disability labels as being dangerous, unable to care for themselves or to have agency, that they are only people that are acted on as opposed to people who can make their own choices about what they need and what they want in order to lead the lives that they understand themselves to be the best um, and to be fulfilling, right? And so this film is really doing the work of this oppressive state it is engineering a system of oppression Olympics and spoiler alert, the only people that win the oppression Olympics are the oppressors. So by perpetuating this narrative, this film is very purposefully and very intentionally seeking to divide our movements. Disability justice requires that within our spaces, when mad folk and psychiatric service users and survivors are talking about how to advance our liberation, that we do so in partnership with our siblings who have other experiences of disability and who uh, are also facing a system that seeks to medicalize distress that acts upon them instead of working to support and uplift them and that ultimately is seeking to reify anti-black and capitalist notions of who is valuable and who is disposable. Thank you, Asa. Thank you, Asa. So we're moving on to Leah Harris and my question for you, Leah is how might this movie interact with broader mental health policy agendas? So I think it's really, really important just to sort of add on to uh, the, the way that Azza uh, grounded us in this conversation. Um, 
uh, it was really important to understand who made this film and why, right? To kind of get the background behind it and how that interacts with a much larger story around mental health care in the settler colonial US. So just to be clear, uh, most uh, massive psychiatric institutions were closed down in the 1960s and 70s because they were horrible snake pits that warehoused people and buried them in mass unmarked graves. And so people decided at some point that we wanted to stop doing that. So we can definitely get into a big time critique of aspects of Ken Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest from race and gender perspectives, and I'm down for that. Um, but the story was based on a real mental hospital where Kesey himself worked. And he said at the time himself, if anything, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest as a fictionalized version did not adequately portray the horror of these places. Almost as soon as the asylums close, there have been folks clamoring for them to reopen. Largely, it's caregivers, cops, and psychiatrists who fall into what I call the pro-force treatment camp. They've been pushing for a set of policy priorities that all revolve around force and coercion and the erosion of the privacy rights of people who are labeled with psychiatric illnesses in favor of caregiver access. And they have fought, as I said, to reopen the asylums. They fought to dismantle the federal protection and advocacy system, which is one of the few federally funded avenues for protecting the rights of people who are stuck in jails or institutions. So just notice those two things. They've also been big pushers of so-called therapeutic jurisprudence, uh, mental health courts, uh, so-called assisted outpatient treatment, which is a euphemism for forced outpatient commitment. It's all about using the black robe effect, making people go before a judge uh, or a so-called problem solving court who compels them to comply with treatment under threat of reincarceration if they don't adhere to the draconian treatment and supervision uh, requirements that have already been described to some extent. And so they push this as a more humane and compassionate alternative to mass incarceration or, or institutionalization. Uh, and I want people out from behind all the cages as bad as any abolitionist, but it's really just moving the social control into the community. So it's really, really important to understand that. Um, and on the other side, you have civil and human rights, disability rights, movements led by marginalized and disabled people uh, for justice. Uh, for example, in 1999, uh, the landmark Olmstead versus LC uh, Supreme Court decision ruled that people have the right to receive treatment and services in a least restrictive, most integrated community setting. So what a bunch of us have been trying to do in different ways, uh, starting with movements of disabled people, ex-psychiatric patients since the 60s and 70s, along with uh, all all forms of abolitionists is to really put together an abolition uh, perspective when it comes to these large state institutions uh, and the institution, uh, the guild interests of psychiatry itself. We've been fighting for the promise of Olmstead, even going further back. Uh, it's referred to in the film. Olmstead is not referred to in the film, by the way, uh, but the promise made by JFK when he signed the Community Mental Health Act, uh, when he signed that into law in 1963. Karis Myrick is an LA-based uh, advocate who provided a lot of comments for my, the article that I wrote today about Bedlam, and Karis talked about how we're still waiting on that promise. We're also still waiting for the US to ratify uh, and uh, adopt all of the protocols of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which was authored, authored by disabled people and psychiatric survivors, uh, some of who I think are in the audience, uh, and also to actually adhere uh, to all its uh, protocols, as I said. Now, if you wanna understand this pro-force uh, treatment camp that I talked about, you have to know about the Treatment Advocacy Center, which is super, super relevant here because it played a major role in the message the film puts out. Uh, I write about how they even sort of bragged about their role in Be Bedlam in their 20th anniversary report. So in the time I have left, I think I'm doing okay on time, I just wanna take you, come on a little journey, uh, please, <laughs> uh, into the timeline of this work. <laughs> and how it connects to Bedlam. 
uh, if you will. So 1998, Treatment Advocacy Center is a kind of beltway policy shop. So it was founded in 1998. It was founded by a psychiatrist named E. Fuller Torrey, T-O-R-R-E-Y, who is convinced that cat poop causes schizophrenia, just FYI. Uh, Phyllis Vine, who's a writer, I believe is in the audience, I hope, with us tonight, um, wrote a piece almost 20 years ago about these folks for FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, describing Tori as, quote, a man with a mission to force people with schizophrenia and manic depressive illness into involuntary treatment, unquote. Tori's outfit is mainly supported by the Stanley Medical Research Institute, which funds, uh, quote, biological interventions and treatment trials focused on schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. That's from their website. Um, I can't, even, I don't even know how many millions, I'd, I'd have to do that research, but how many millions have been poured into this work. Um, just to say, Treatment Advocacy Center engages in media advocacy, and I see this film as an example of that. Uh, you also will see them quoted everywhere in almost any article about mental health. Um, also legislative advocacy, fighting for forced treatment laws on all the levels, state, uh, county, state, and federal. They do quote research, they quote write reports that get picked up in the press and academia ad infinitum. And 1999, I want to zero in on, you see the deliberate PR concoction of the narrative that is presented to us in Bedlam. How the Treatment Advocacy Center, you know, purposely cooked up this whole narrative, right, this treatment, not jails messaging as an intentional PR campaign focusing on public health or public safety, sorry, instead of mental health to spin those issues. And Phyllis also writes about that in the article. Um, so thus, you know, uh, there's the hyping, right, of the violent mentally ill, quote, unquote. Uh, since it was also, we can say this was the era that mass shootings began at Columbine. So this was gold for these folks. They knew that they could get more traction on a policy agenda to control us if they portrayed us, as Azza talked about, as dangerous, violent, or criminals. Um, I'm going to say Phyllis wrote a, a great quote about this. I really encourage you. We'll put this in the links, but just exactly how in a in a meeting how this these ideas you know were concocted and this was a deliberately uh, created narrative. Um, so in the interest of time, um, you know, I'm just going to say that you know they've been extremely successful. Uh, at capitalizing on the fears that society has about unhoused people, uh, about people with mental health diagnoses. Uh, you know, they were able to capitalize on extremely rare acts of violence that were committed by someone with a psych diagnosis, although we all know overwhelmingly folks are more likely to be the victims of violence, including police violence. Um, but they capitalized on that violence and got involuntary treatment laws passed all over the place. Um, and then I want to fast forward to 2013. Uh, Sandy Hook opened up a whole new world for these folks because they found a champion in Congressman Tim Murphy, a Republican from Pittsburgh who later resigned in scandal and disgrace, was so, said to have abused his staff. Um, he went on TV after every mass shooting talking about uh, that it was due to, you know, untreated, quote, mental illness and how forced mental health treatment would fix this and end homelessness and incarceration. We spent years fighting this dude in Congress. And uh, we were able, you know, through a whole coalition of works and groups, were able to get some of the worst provisions kind of softened, but uh, his stuff got put into 21st century cures. Um, and I realize I'm almost out of time. If I may have a minute of grace time, that would be wonderful. Um, this takes us all the way uh, to Trump's White House. I wrote about a summit there in December hosted by Dr. Drew, quote, uh, coronavirus is a hoax, quote, Pinsky, who pushed this narrative, um, featuring treatment advocacy center folks and friends, um, you know, and I want to just read a quote just so you have no doubt about who you're dealing with here. I want to read a quote from one of the panelists named DJ, DJ Jaffe, who is their, one of their PR people who has a PR background and has a cameo in Bedlam. This is what this guy said at Trump's White House. Quote, meet with your police, meet with your sheriff without mental health people in the room. Sorry, 
So they don't have to be politically correct and they can talk about the real issues that need solving. And in order to solve the issues of civil commitment and assisted outpatient commitment, we have to stand up to the ACLU, to Bazelon, to disability rights, to protection and advocacy, to the many mental health groups who believe that being psychotic and delusional is a right to be protected rather than an illness to be treated, unquote. So just have no doubt about who you're dealing with here. There's many, many other aspects of this I could talk about in terms of advocacy that these folks have done with uh, political candidates like Kamala Harris to try to influence her mental health plan. I wrote about that for Mad America. Check it out. Other folks have written about it as well. Um, uh, one other thing to bring it back to Bedlam real quick, super quick before I pass it on. Um, you know, Kenneth Paul Rosenberg, the filmmaker, acts like he's a neutral chronicler of reality. Uh, with uh, his camera lens, um, but please know that this is not true and that he has pushed for every one of the oppressive items on Treatment Advocacy Center's menu uh, policy agenda publicly in interviews and in his book. And this stuff matters. Um, Mab Segrist, who wrote this new book, Administrations of Lunacy, which you also get the links to that, looks at the history of the Southern Asylum uh, psychiatry through an anti-racist lens. And she writes in the book, um, that we have too many histories and too many accounts written by white men, you know, white dudes of talking about psychiatry. And it's, it's really high time, Mab says, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's high time for new voices that lead with racial justice, disability justice, and social justice as the frame. So I hope that was helpful in terms of background. I apologize for taking up so much time, but uh, thank you so much for listening and I will pass it on. But yeah, that was really super powerful. I've got like the full body chills going on. I'm really, I'm, su I'm like, I'm so glad we're doing this panel. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm actually going to take a couple questions that people have sent in and just open it up. And we're just going to do this short, you know, before we pass things on. So Akeem's going to getting the next question, but in between, um, here's, here's the two questions for you. And it, they're from Celia Brown and Phil Llanos. I'm just going to put the questions together and then you can answer it how you want. So Celia Brown, Miss you Celia, um, uh, she says, how do we get more black indigenous people, black and indigenous people to the table? So that's Celia Brown's question. Filianos's question is, how can we start to, un how can we start to unite social justice movements so that people with mental health system experiences and diagnosis are not the ones that are left out? I love your comment about pitting communities against each other, divide and conquer, but I see it happening constantly. So there you go. Those are the questions I want to just like, who's got, who's got thoughts? Yeah, Felix. Um, so as to Phil Janos's, Philip Janos's question, how can we unite um, social justice movements um, so we can bring in everybody? I think that, um, we have to realize that um, there are pipelines that create these traumas that require healing, and all of all of these um, all of these pathways are connected: school, prison, homelessness, uh, reincarceration, um, perpetual homelessness. I think that we we have to realize that um, we need to put preventative measures in place right now and community uh, reinvestments ASAP. I think what we actually should be doing is just trying to understand that any kind of oppressive system does not deserve space right now, that there should be interruptions to that. And um, we should be looking at how these pipelines actually um, facilitate growth for these industries. And also um, with, current, um, pan with the current pandemic and the talk of mental health and whatnot, and also the, the initiatives that happened recently in New York City, the Thrive Initiative about bringing mental health professionals into schools. Now there's more, um, you know, people are doing uh, teletherapy, uh, telediagnosing. I think that we should really get to a point where we can actually talk about emotional issues in a healthy context where it's not medicalized, pathologized, and criminalized later on. Um, for that, I think that we should really get to the root of um, societal issues and why these systems actually exist and start looking at why they're incentivized to continue to exist. Um, 
the reason that there is homelessness is because it's a manufactured problem. The reason why you know there are mental health diagnoses that are perpetuated is because the current crises that are manipulated into creating dynamics that um, define others forever. And uh, that is something that is, that is way beyond toxic. Imagine um, being diagnosed and having your power removed away from you. Imagine being criminalized for that. Imagine being nothing more than a, a pieces of paper put together and then you're stuck with that. I think we should look at everything that is happening right now Obviously, the school systems are not not put together properly. That's why there's such a talk about uh, redoing the school year. You know, we're talking about the the incentivizing of uh, mental health mental health access. But we're, what we're not actually talking about is actually reducing trauma. How do we actually heal people? How do we actually remove away the um the systems that are in place that actually refuse 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 to actually um, allow someone to identify how they wish to. Thank you, Felix. That's really, yeah. I mean, there's like, there's a lot there to work with. Anybody else on this question? Yeah, Asa. Uh, this is Asa. Just one thing I also want to add, even in the framing of how do we ensure that Black and Indigenous and other historically marginalized groups are at the table, kind of presumes that the table is controlled by white folks, and it's a matter of inviting um, people of color, particularly Black and Indigenous people, to participate. And that it really should not be our context or, or the starting point. We are talking about transformation. We are talking about dismantling those exclusive exclusionary systems and reimagining something in its place that's actually about the collective liberation and justice. And so I, I just wanted to name that explicitly. And also in so doing, I wanted to name that part of the reason that the state kind of uses this language of pathologizing and medicalizing that which is actually simply a product of oppression um, is because the state has for the entirety of this country's history used and leveraged ableism in service of its capitalistic and anti-black and settler colonial project right it is precisely because of the systems of ableism and sanism that the state can use these labels, these psychiatric diagnosis labels, and to use physical disability status and all kinds of disability presentation and labels in order to exert control over groups that have been historically marginalized and from whom labor has historically been violently extracted and whose land and resources have been stolen. And so a really like clear example of this that we see all the time is how Black people get swept up within these systems even when they don't have a disability even when they don't present with one. Simply the act of the state assigning that label on a Black person is categorizing that Black body as one that is disposable, that can be disappeared into an institution, whether it's a carceral institution that's a jail or a prison, or a carceral institution that's a state psychiatric hospital. And it is done with the explicit intent to extract their labor, deny their agency, and further the anti-Black settler colonial project that this country is so deeply invested in. Thank you, Asa. Anybody else? Seriously, it's so powerful. All right, all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on then. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna move on to Akeem. So Akeem, I have a question for you, and I'm pulling it up right now. And it is, the criminal justice, the criminal justice and mental health systems have been described as two sides of the carceral system. Um, this film Bedlam pushes a treatment, not incarceration message. How do you see the connection between these two systems? Thanks. Uh, you know, that, that question when it was uh, brought up about uh, understanding uh, the treatment non-incarceration, you know, that narrative is, I think, uh, truly a demonizing or pitting community against uh, community because uh, that message is saying, well, you want to treat them, don't you? you? You think that they have these, uh, these issues and you don't want to put them in jail. But I think we need to start looking at, is th are those the only two questions that could be asked, or those are those the only two options that could be uh, given? And I don't believe so. I, I believe one society as a one. I'm a sociologist and uh, understanding how communities and society works. Um, I, I realize that in society we uh, favor the happy, healthy, and successful. 
Uh, but when it comes to the unhealthy, uh, the not happy, the unsuccessful, we consider them throwaways. We walk right over their body. Our, com our, our, our government has conditioned us to believe that they're not us. I mean, in New York City, uh, one of our uh, mayors um, uh, had passed a Clean New York Act back in uh, the year 2008. And Clean New York Act sounded good. So language is one of the keys that we keep, or should keep in mind that Clean New York Act was actually to clean up all the homelessness in New York. So they developed a $4 million boat that they put people on that were homeless and they were conducting interviews on the street, basically to find out who either had families or not and someone that would be missed or not, I would, I would assume. But it was under the Clean New York Act. So society has to like really be re-educated because language is the key. It's a tool that is always used against us. They know um, that not everyone has the uh, mindset or the cap uh, capability while they're uh, working at, at their jobs. If they don't have the understanding to uh, understand how government is using them or pitting them against one another. Um, treatment shouldn't look like only medicinal purpose where you're locked down, forced uh, to take medication and uh, thrown away. Uh, I've never actually known treatment uh, uh, in that manner that's taking, that's inducing or forcing Seroquel to be uh, a longstanding um, a treatment and ever have anything positive that comes out of it. Uh, we got to stop thinking of uh, or stop being pitted against each other where we're only given two options and you think about the two instead of believing that, well, why don't we do something different because the very definition of insanity is to continue doing the same thing over and over expecting different results. You must be insane and I guess the country has been insane for the longest because we continue doing incarceration uh, or slavery uh, for 400 years. And well, the result, the, the result was what they wanted. We as a people or people who didn't want it was the only ones, but it was initiated because the result was what they wanted. And then it turned into this carceral state where we were believed to think that people with the, with the title of criminal uh, were, were not to be cared for. I think like Felix had said, we are not dealing with caring for people. We're not correcting. Uh, we use these terms or this, this language, corrections, um, uh, Department of Justice, um, uh, all these terms that sound good, but, does, but, but isn't actually doing what it says. And so getting back to like, uh, the film pushes this as though like this, this message um, is like what we should have, like treatment instead of incarceration. I take it in terms of me personally as my family, uh, Khalif needed uh, what I would say um, community. When he came home after uh, doing, serving his three years, he needed community. That means counseling, therapy, uh, measures in the community that says, you know what, uh, we have this for everyone and you can join in. Like we, we, we have no funding for community. We have no, uh, we have no funding for community or community um, projects. So it, we, we have to stop looking at it also as just one thing. Because as I was talking to uh, you, Sasha, earlier um, when we first um, discussed this, we look at one thing in society and try and diagnose it as for what it is. But there's many measures external that um, play a part into that one thing. So if we're talking about incarceration uh, for those that committed a crime, well, what are the external features that cause them to be where they are? Are they mentally ill? What kind of illness do they have? Or is it community? Do, do they have, are they brought up in destitute communities where uh, they have to fight for uh, a chance to survive? They're not given uh, opportunities and privileges to survive. They're just, they're, they have to make it, they have to survive. We, we are not realizing that society brings our community, our people to this. We're only human beings. If you put us uh, in, a, in a position where our back is against the wall, I'm not committing a crime because I want to. Some people are committing crimes because they have to. I can't eat. I can't make a living because you gave me a, felon, a felony status. 
and now basically I'm thrown away. And now you want me to be a productive member to society? Well, I can't. And so now my back is against the wall and I might have to do something that I don't even want to do, but I had to prepare myself mentally to right this wrong that I'm going to do. I mean, we're, we're damaging people uh, just like, again, like Felix said, and we're, we're damaging people and not causing or, or creating methods of listening. We're not listening to people. We're not caring for people. And we're definitely not treating people. So get rid of that term and introduce something else. There's lots of uh, uh, thoughts or schools of thought out there. There's, uh, I mean, look at the, uh, in Islam, uh, people aren't judged by just the DA. The families are involved. I mean, there's treatment on both ends. There's the, the perpetrator and then the victim and the families of the victims. And yet we are constantly uh, told that, you know, uh, the DA is fighting, is the mouthpiece for the uh, community or the person or the victim, but we do not see the victim's family putting their, in, or having their input in society, uh, in, in, that, uh, in that role of uh, whether this person is gonna do time, some families, could find healing in, um, in forgiveness and not causing a life sentence or something. Or, uh, I mean, there, there's, there's no real thought in, in what we're doing. We're, we're, I guess, putting on a smoke screen and allowing ourselves to believe because we're just playing a part of the carceral system. Uh, so I, I, I really see this in this film, um, the, the connection uh, between these two treatment or not incarceration, uh, this message is not what we really should be thinking about. We should be thinking about outside of the message and why are they constantly trying to make us think of these two things only. Just like with coronavirus right now, COVID is in these jails as it, just as it is on the streets. And yet we are putting people not for not social, uh, social distancing in jail. We're exasperating the circumstances of our, of our community members, of our loved, them, our loved ones, putting them in jail and then for something nonviolent, then they'll get out or they may not make it out because COVID is now in, introduced into their, their well-being. Uh, I, mean, we, we're, I think everyone really, and I'll just summarize it, I'm sorry, I, I don't wanna take too much longer, but we need to, I think, overthrow what's happening or th do away with, uh, with uh, the, the things of the past so that we're not defined as insane technically. Akeem, thank you so much. Thank all of you. So, so here's what's gonna happen right now. Um, we're gonna take a couple minutes and Pauline who's, who's been, um, Pauline who's been the social work intern for the last year at Ida is gonna play a song for us. And, um, and she works with the Poor People's Campaign and she does a lot of really good movement work out there and we're gonna pass it on to her. And this would be a great, time for you to like get up and go you know go run to the bathroom or go get some water or something yes thank you so much sasha so yes hi my name pauline is pauline i use the pronoun she her hers please um just so you know um i uh am a um a femme presenting white woman in her late 30s I have purple hair, a part of my head is shaved. Um, mm -hmm. And I am an organizer, cultural arts organizer with Songs in the Key Resistance, which is a project of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. I'm also an organizer um, at IDA, um, as Sasha mentioned. I put some lyrics to the song that we're gonna sing in the chat. Um, there are two songs that we're gonna be singing together. One is called We Are the Ones by Keisha Soleil. It was inspired by Sweet Honey in the Rock, and it's based on a poem by June Jordan about the South African anti-apartheid movement. And then we're gonna follow that up with a song called The People Are My Reason, written by the Peace Poets out in Oakland, California. Mm -hmm. uh, so first, if everyone would like to just take a deep collective breath in, mm -hmm. a deep collective breath out. Are, we are the ones we've been waiting for. Our spirits cry and our hearts rejoice. 
We are the ones we've been waiting for our spirits rise and our hearts rejoice. We are the ones we've been waiting for our spirits rise and our hearts rejoice. All we need is each other. Only then will our people recover. All we need is each other. Only then will our people recover. All we need is each other. Only then will our people recover. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Our spirits cry and our hearts rejoice. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Our spirits cry and our hearts rejoice. We are the ones we've been waiting for. You can't hide from freedom. You can't hide from freedom. You can't hide. 
very much. I'm going to put the Poor People's Campaign songbook in the chat. So that's a great resource that has a lot of videos and music samples that you can use across movement spaces because we are building bridges. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pauline. Thank you so much, Pauline. All right. So, well, so, uh, so I'm going to ask a question that, uh, we get, we've had so many good questions. We're never going to get through them all. Um, but I chose one from Zinlin in New York, who is, uh, you know, who's like an important person in our Ida world. And um, she's also a psychiatrist. And she asked the question, and this is for all of you, like anyone who wants to answer. Um, as we saw at Real Abilities Festival, as we saw at the Real Abilities Festival discussion, there's a lot of defensiveness amongst, among psychiatrists when discussing these issues, oppressiveness of the psychiatric system, complicity of psychiatry with racism, for example. What can be done about this? How do we engage with psychiatrists who are deeply invested in the biomedical model and their sense of their profession as doing good? Because it's this perspective that has led to make a film like Bedlam. So anyone, who, anyone who's got thoughts, we're open. May yeah, I? Leia. Thanks for the question. Um, I'll just share quickly. I read the book White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo, D-I-A-N-G-E-L-O. And reading that book, I was really struck by the similarities in terms of what was just described. And I don't know if anybody else has used this specific language, but what really sparked it for me was that this is uh, clinical fragility. Uh, this is exhibiting many of the same forms as white fragility that's outlined in D'Angelo's work, such as defensiveness, uh, gaslighting, um, not all psychiatrists, right? All the different you know, uh, manifestations of that defensiveness. In terms of how do you counter it, um, you know, like, this is just my perspective. I think you counter it by abolishing 99.9% .9 of psychiatry. That would be one way to take care of it. Um, you know, I think it's difficult because even other medical professionals have a hard time getting through. Um, Gabor Mate, M-A-T-E, talks about, uh, I believe, the higher your education level, the less open you are to new ideas. So I wish I had an answer um, because I don't, I'll leave it for anybody else who does, but I think uh, we need to constrain psychiatry and it shouldn't have, you know, Peter Stastny, S-T-A-S-T-N-Y is a psychiatrist who I've interviewed who really talked about how they, they just shouldn't have the power to control people's lives or make decisions about their fate. That's another way I would handle it. And then they can feel how they want about themselves and their work. All right, Leah, thank you. Anybody else thoughts on this? Yeah, Felix. Can you um, hear me? Yeah, Felix, go for it. I think that we should all really start actually like, having um, uh, a person. Can you hear me? 
Yes? I can hear you. Yeah, go for it. Yes. Okay, cool. cool. All right. Um, I think, I think that we, we should really actually have someone present with people while they're actually um, experiencing crises that um, is impartial to, uh, to um, the medical model. I think that first and foremost, we need to start empowering people to actually take care of um, themselves and actually have accountability partners, perhaps in community that do advocacy to actually um, have people uh, minimize these interactions. I think if uh, people were really aware of the manipulative nature of psychiatry and also being hospitalized, the gaslighting that happens, the denial of identity, and also just the, um, the refusal of resources, then people would actually see what's happening. Imagine if, um, imagine if the sessions with psychiatrists were actually recorded by law. Imagine if you could actually see the transcript of what was said. Imagine if you actually had someone there that could actually relate to you in your language, how you, how you, um, I, how you actually speak, how you actually learn. Imagine someone just being there with you while you experience that, as opposed to being in a room, basically being interrogated by a psychiatrist that can just run rampant and describe you however he wishes forever and ever and ever. And I think with that, um, we just need to have someone present there to hold accountability um, just as we call for accountability in the justice system, we should actually call for accountability on how people are defined psychiatrically. Yeah, right. Yeah, right on. In many ways, you know, um, I don't know if you know this, Felix, but I, you said you, you worked as a peer specialist. My, uh, I, spent, I spent three years working with peer specialists in the public mental health system in New York. And ideally, people working in peer roles have the ability to do that. But oftentimes what happens is that there's so little power to, you know, there's so you, that you, like people, once you want, once you're out about your psychiatric diagnosis, your credibility goes so down in that system that it's hard to, it's hard to negotiate it. Yeah, Akeem. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I, I want to offer a, so, a, an idea as I was telling you before that, you know, if we if we are to minimize uh, the use of what we normally do, like the uh, jailing or uh, institutionalization, how does that look? And so first, that means even if I can give this right now, we want to empower the, the society to be able to uh, critically think uh, so that they can uh, get to a point where they can think for themselves. I think a lot of it is because we are dictated to uh, instead of um, being uh, brought together as community to think on uh, real societal issues. Uh, so if we were to like develop uh, or like limit the number of mental health uh, uh, hospitals so that we can have the chance, like if you limit certain things like the amount of jails that we have, I mean, I'm an abolitionist, abolitionist through and through. However, if you wanna say like, listen, keep doing what you're doing because you're, you're not gonna stop, that's your system. But you know what, allocate some funding for uh, new ideas, new perspectives, so that you can get what you want, but this is gonna work over here, because we're gonna try doing something new, but we need the funding for it. I, 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 we can't talk about doing anything without funding, because then it just sounds like volunteerism. And that's actually uh, hurtful to, to a lot of communities as well, because you can't really volunteer uh, the amount of uh, time that you that is necessary uh, to, to fix issues. Um, but you know what? get into some kind of programs and stuff like that. Like why, uh, when it comes to mental health, we could institute a lot of different things, different practices throughout the world that, I mean, we're, we're a melting pot in America. And so why we only, why we don't take on what they do in uh, Australia or what they do in India, um, like just so that we can have some kind of difference, but why they do it, obviously we know why. The system is not broken. It's meant to do what it does so that there's people that they can use as chattel slavery, or, or we're all chattel slavery, we, so that we can still have slavery and control at, uh, at uh, an extent that they want. Um, so this is the issue, and I, 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 don't, I don't think uh, us manifesting a bunch of ideas is just gonna make uh, people come, uh, or the government do what we ask. I think we need people power. We need uh, organization, not organizations, people coming together in communities and you do that in small communities so that it could branch off and grow. So we could have like little areas demonstrate what real community looks like. 
And I guarantee you when people are thought that they're important and they're, they're necessary, then you'll have uh, people that start healing themselves because you'll have community, but you're also thought of as important. You know how many people are thrown away in society? And since they're thrown away, they turn to liquor and alcohol. Look how many mothers lose their kids because they were uh, on some kind of like uh, drugs or alcohol. And then you take the kid and with no chance of giving them back, that's gonna cause someone to have mental illness. And so, or, or some kind of depression. And so we're, we're perpetuating yet saying we need to do something about this. Anyway, I'm done, thank you. All right, thank you, Akeem. Yeah, awesome. Um, I'll be brief, but um, particularly hearing Akeem's reflections, it made me want to also bring into the space um, two core principles of the disability justice framework um, are a commitment to an anti-capitalist politic and following the leadership of the most impacted. And those are two elements that are completely and utterly absent within psychiatry. And really, I think, lies at the root of both the defensiveness and the resistance to all of the critiques um, and this kind of justice-based work that we're doing. Um, and I think there are two really good examples of this in how um, the state orders psychiatry and how it um, exerts control and power over particular groups. Um, one is the fact that we have these like really strict credentialing systems, um, including for peer support. And it is not because of um, any like evidence that this somehow ensures that those who are um, engaged in the work are doing it better. It is strictly and solely done in order to control and limit access um, to care and to healing, and to similarly limit those who actually end up in positions of power who would be able to transform how psychiatry is practiced, right, in order to actually be more aligned with the needs of historically marginalized groups. So this ensures that psychiatry continues to reify these oppressive um, systems and tactics. And the other thing that I want to uplift too, we've talked a lot about the impacts on Black people. One of the things that we also see in how the field itself has kind of um, systematized and, and ordered itself is also in the development of so-called evidence-based practices. And how that kind of body of work and these evidence-based practices end up really completely um, maligning and erasing the traditional practices of healing that emerged within various spaces. So numerous indigenous nations and peoples who had created effective practices of communal healing and care that were utterly obliterated through this creation of a state controlled process that um, identified certain practices as being evidence based. And what I and what I really want to emphasize there is they're like, it's evidence-based because there's a body of literature that supports this. But the only subjects that we will study are middle-aged, are sorry, college age to middle-aged white, usually men. And therefore, we're going to take this really specific population and use that in order to uh, create a system of quote unquote care and treatment and universalize that. And so it is working in a way that completely obscures what the actual intent of the, the, the design of psychiatry was. It is a fundamentally anti-Black and settler colonial project. And it is just like every other institutional arrangement in this country designed in order to continue to perpetuate those systems. Thank you, Asa. So, um, so moving back on to to you know our our questions, I have one for Felix, and this is your question. One of the subjects in the film in Bedlam, Todd, was unhoused. The film follows his search for housing. How does the film portray the housing crisis and mental health? You know I me. Mean? Um, the film portrays it. Oh. Pretty close for the um, pretty close as far as the um, the the insanity of it all, the the nature of having to wait for an opportunity to be removed from the elements that are toxic and dangerous to you, which are being uh, unhoused and or being in shelter, and um, it's really just a game of 
um, wait, 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 and hopefully some things happen. Uh, the 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 um, the individual in the film, Todd, he actually, while waiting on his housing, he, he uh, caught um, HIV as a result of intravenous drug use that he was doing so that he could actually cope with the circumstances while he was waiting on housing. Now, having been formerly homeless, also being formerly incarcerated, um, becoming homeless as a result of my building being turned into a shelter as a cluster site, um, because that's the nature of uh, housing in New York. They can just, um, the landlord will make money off your apartment, empty or whatever. Um, and the thing is, is that um, people are suffering because there is not affordability. With that affordability of uh, pro pro provision of housing, people can move on to become productive members of society. Imagine being able to no longer have to worry about what will I eat today? Where will I sleep? Where can I get to a heating vent and such? Um, imagine being um, dealing with all those elements, being on medication, then having to make these appointments on a timely basis, and then coming in and you're told that, you know, there's nothing happening right now, we just have to wait. Um, waiting is a matter of dying and living. And I think that's something that people don't realize is that um, where will you get your mail at? Where will you get, where will you store your, store your um, possessions at? Where will your um, birth certificate, your social security card, your um, high school diploma, your college degree, those are things that you need in order to transition out of homelessness and destitution into a career path and also an apartment. Imagine, um, just imagine not having anything and then just having to depend on the kindness, the kindness of these systems that are very much um, created and manufactured because homelessness is manufactured. Um, let, let's be real. There's so much. There's so many millions to it that um, you know that uh, the the city, the different municipal municipalities will actually pay uh, to house a person in shelter more than they would in an apartment, and that's just ridiculous. I think that we need to start realizing the money that is actually being thrown away, thrown away, thrown away, uh, in these circumstances is is beyond like beyond any amount can make up for like the, the toil on the human body, the mind, the heart, the soul. Imagine just losing yourself more and more and more every day that things that are abnormal that weren't seem to be okay. Today, I feel like getting high today. Today, I feel like getting like drinking. I will not eat today because I need to cope with what I'm going through. And then to have to be I'm available at a phone call. Where will I sleep? Will I get enough sleep so I can wake up between nine and five when these organizations actually run that provide housing? I think that um, there, are, there are just so much that needs to be done. And just look at it. No one understands homelessness until it becomes you, until it becomes you. So people that are suffering from the, like now during this pandemic, where everyone is worried about the rent being paid as they should, now people are actually seeing what's happening. Now, you know, we have these lockdowns happening where people are being, uh, you know, taken off the street and put, um, you know, being sent to shelters against their will. Um, they're, they're going because it might be the best place to get out of the elements. But imagine just having to deal with a pandemic in the middle of the street when everything is closed, having to line up on lines to get the basic necessities. That is just, um, it's unconscionable that we as a nation and we as a world will actually incentivize the creation of shelters, the, the fabrication of bureaucratic red tape in place that does not allow someone to actually use a restroom, you know, take a shower, you know, eat, eat three square meals a day, you know, eat more than, you know, cheese sandwiches or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, the homelessness problem right now is actually um, related to the mental health issue because people that are homeless to um, their entry point into housing is the mental health system in some cases. And that right there is why. That is one of the ways where people can actually make a income as well as create a pathway to get into supportive housing where um, their needs will properly be, supposed to probably be, properly be met. And that is something that we need to start looking at is what kind of housing is being provided for people currently in the street about to lose their home, coming home from prisons and jails, what are we doing for them? Are we actually putting in communities of care? Are we putting in collateral supports? Are we putting in agencies that do more than just intake, intake, intake? Are we actually putting, um, are we gonna put people over profits? Are we gonna keep incentivizing and manufacturing these shelters for what? There are people dying 
I don't know about um, anyone else out there, but for me, I am an empath and highly sensitive person. So I always feel that. I feel when someone is actually at their worst. I feel that, I see, I internalize it. And then I, I carry that with me. So for me to actually um, be able to um, have experienced what I experienced, it's made me a, a speaker. But again, like I never wanted the trauma of all that. That could be prevented. All of that could be prevented for everyone. We, we should actually start looking at Todd's frustration as the baseline for what happens. And you might, you, you just saw just brief moments of his life right there, but you didn't see the destitution and the other things that happened, the indignities that actually happened, how he was actually transitioning to obtaining HIV and contracting it. We need to start realizing what is actually happening to the homeless in the street, in the shelters, and those without. At the end of the day, either to go for advice before food, it's, it's indicative of a problem that we need to address. Is that seven? Good? Yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Thank you, man. All right. All right. This next question is for Aza. So the question is, um, how do the intersecting and entrenched systems, this is such a good question. I'm so excited to hear you answer it. How do the intersecting and entrenched systems of ableism, white supremacy, and capitalism show up in the documentary? Thank you. So I think I've alluded a little bit to how these systems are showing up both in Bedlam, the documentary, but also in the kind of broader agenda that undergirds the, the film itself. So I want to start by kind of emphasizing that they left out a whole lot of history and a whole lot of context. Um, and the simplest starting point is that the kind of construction of asylums, the kind of construction of this very carceral um, mental health care system, right, and I'm using air quotes there because it's not a care system at all, um, is inextricably tied to slavery and the kind of development of this um, settler colonial project. And so one, the film kind of talks about asylums as just a place where people were warehoused and received treatment. And by that, they mean a violence exacted upon them in order to control and regulate their behavior. Um, but it was also critically, and this wasn't mentioned in the film, a place where labor was extracted, right? So we really saw the development of these institutions at a time where uh, slavery was formally, chattel slavery was formally ending. And all of a sudden, the state transitions from enslaving people um, and extracting labor violently through that system to incarcerating people over made up offenses and new offenses and through the system of incarceration, extracting their labor violently a new version of slavery. And when neither of those options were available, people were labeled with um, psychiatric labels and then institutionalized. And through that institutionalization, we're told that your forced labor is therapeutic. It is treatment. It will be used to regulate your behavior and conduct against this white supremacist capitalist norm that we have generated, right? And so that, that history was left out intentionally, right? And that through line is how we come to understand the, the genesis of a system that is as carceral as the one that we have today, right? The, uh, to kind of, to quote Suzanne Plissick, um, and I'll drop her name in the chat because I don't know how she pronounces her, or spells her last name. But as she mentions, the story of race in this country is the story of labor. It is about labor theft and extraction. It is about resource theft and extraction. And the mental health system and how it shows up is part of that history, right? Even today, when we talk about how to um, support people with mental illness labels, there's often, it's couched within this capitalistic language of how do we restore them to productivity? Right? So normalcy then is attached to the production of capital to advance the state's interests. And that kind of dynamic in that history was completely erased from the film. 
I also want to uplift that, as I mentioned earlier, um, negatively racialized people, so Black and Native and Latinx people, experience the burdens of Sanism and ableism irrespective of their actual disability status. And to give you a contemporary example of that, um, not that long ago, a Black woman in Florida was approached by police officers and they did not actually have any legally justifiable reason for apprehending and exacting violence on this black woman. So what they did instead, because it was the state of Florida, was they invoked the Baker Act, which allows for a temporary detention when someone is, has a psychiatric disability. Now they attach that label because there wasn't really a burden of proof that's particularly uh, high to reach. And so when they were not able to exact carceral control over this black woman through the traditional criminal legal system, they used the psychiatric system in order to achieve the same end, confinement and violence, right? And so we are seeing that this is a, a carceral, um, not only a carceral system, but it is a mechanism by which the state is able to uh, extend its, its sphere of control over historically marginalized groups. And that context is, again, left out of this film. It talks about Black Lives Matter, and it makes an allusion to how there's stigma around mental illness in Black communities, as though the problem is that Black people are not informed. The problem isn't that we're not informed. The problem is that we know our history. The problem is that we know that the first formal articulations of diagnosis of psychiatric disability were specifically created in order to justify our conditions of enslavement, right? And so we know that there are diagnoses like drapetomania, D-R-A-P-E-T-O-M-I-A, that existed within the first kind of iteration of what would ultimately become the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that pathologized and rendered a mental illness the act of resistance to um, the conditions of slavery, right? And this justified white people, white enslavers, using violence and coercive actions to control and regulate black bodies and minds in order to extract labor. And then when you take that and you follow that and skip forward in history, you also see that within the 1960s, as black people are rising against their systematic oppression and the violence that they are being subject to, and the ways that they are being violated by the state through Jim Crow and through centuries of, of enslavement, disenfranchisement, and oppression. That again, the psychiatric establishment, namely the American Psychiatric Association itself, changes the diagnostic criteria of schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders in order to include things such as aggression, right, <laughs> and violence in ways that would ultimately create cover for pathologizing Black people and specifically Black men's resistance to oppression, racial oppression. And so what we end up with today is that Black people within the US and the UK, and not anywhere else on the earth, but in the US and the UK, Black people remain diagnosed with psychotic disabilities at a rate that is three times, and in some cases higher, than their non-Black peers. That's a function of a system that really kind of has assembled the gears of capitalism, anti-blackness, white supremacy, and settler colonization, and ableism and sanism in order to exert control over so-called deviant and historically marginalized groups, and in order to facilitate and accelerate the concentration of wealth and power in ever fewer hands. All right, all right. Thank you, Asa. So, we're we're uh, we're getting towards the end here, and so we have two last questions, and they're for they're for all of you. I mean, if it, or like you, you, not everyone don't feel like you have to answer, but um, and I might. This is okay. So here we go. I'm going to read it first. Recent headlines in the news mention how COVID nineteen is pushing America into a mental health crisis. How might this documentary interact with the current crisis we're all collectively facing? How can we talk about our mental health during, these pan, dur during this pandemic? And just a reminder to keep your response to, to two to three minutes. 
Thank you. Anyone feeling this question? Hello. Hey. Yeah. So, uh, actually, I, I think this is a really good question because this leads to like uh, answers that, that can actually help people in the here and now and anyone that's listening. So uh, the events that we're dealing with is definitely trying. Um, and I mean that in many ways where where some people are actually in their houses and it could feel like uh, in isolation. Uh, and we know that isolation uh, for too long actually from uh, is uh, very damaging to someone's uh, mental uh, mental wealth, uh, well-being. And so um, I, I, I believe that there's uh, hotlines that you can talk to, but also reaching out to uh, people that like, if you're not suffering anything at the moment or you're, you're handling it better and coping, I, uh, as, I'm, as I'm thinking about like the alternatives or things that, other, um, that we can do uh, while we're in these uh, uh, times, reaching out to people like uh, in your immediate community, uh, whether it's by phone or even at the door of someone um, that you know that maybe your neighbors or uh, can, can actually help uh, someone's uh, mental well-being because it's that communication. Um, that is more than likely going to uh, help because it's it's interaction with other people. Um, I'll I'll leave it at that because I I don't I don't want to overload. Yeah yeah yeah. All right, Leah. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know I'm struck by something in relation to this question that actually Felix talked about uh, communities of care. Right? How do we respond to COVID? People are already responding. Right, and that's led by most impacted people. Nobody's paying them. Systems are sitting back. They don't know what to do. People are mobilizing. Um, so I think we need to do away with mental health systems or systems of care and build up uh, communities of care, right? Um, and I just want to share something I wrote uh, today. I'm just kind of, again, kind of coming back to narrative. I'm sure you all have heard a million times already uh, the avalanche or the tsunami or whatever natural disaster language is invoked to talk about the coming tide of deaths of despair or the, sur the surge of quote unquote mental illness, right? Um, you know, so, you know, I think what I want to say is that not everything that causes uh, mental health issues or distress or all the things that we've talked about can be fixed with more mental health care. Um, people should have access to whatever health care they want or need, like that's not in dispute, but often, as we've been talking about, uh, the, the quote, the problem is the problem, quote, and I don't know who said that, but, uh, you know, the problems that we've outlined, right, white supremacy, neoliberalism, patriarchy, settler colonialism, right, and so the human distress is the result, and so what I would say is that we need a society that takes care of its people. We need to push back on these medicalized narratives about our reactions to COVID or any any other kind of oppression or pain or grief or fear. We need supports that acknowledge how, can I say, fucked up, uh, everything is and don't try to make us or how our brains or bodies are reacting in the middle of pandemic into a quote problem. Uh, the last thing I'll say is this is not rocket science. Uh, props to all rocket scientists out there. Um, but this takes an anti-oppression analysis that uh, most people are not going to get in their uh, mental health education degrees in capitalist academic spaces. Um, so really what it takes, like in terms of how do we respond, how do we talk about it, is that uh, for folks who care and who are in the mental health space, you know, you need to have a willingness not just to listen to people, like I know that's what you're trained to do, um, but to actively fight alongside them for justice and collective liberation. Um, so if you really wanna stop the coming tsunami, all of y'all who are in the media talking about it, um, that you're so worried about, let's consider maybe addressing the sources of despair all right all right okay and with so with that i'm gonna i'm gonna ask the final question to you all um and i'm, I'm noting the time here we have about 10 minutes so um and i'm just i just want to say that like this has been I'm, I'm having an amazing time with you all okay last question um 
what alternative media have you seen or might you recommend that tell stories about mental health or disability justice? And then there's a second question. So it's like actually, it's actually two questions. So the second question is, if institutionalization isn't the answer, what other options or alternatives are out there? Okay, let's start with Felix. I think um, first we need to actually have way more respite centers out there. First, we need to actually have that information available, what respite centers are, um, and also like people willingly um, telling people about this while they're in the hospital, because apparently that's the thing to do is to uh, withhold information. I think that we should actually definitely, definitely start having more um, more uh, peers everywhere uh, so that uh, that narrative of alternatives is available for people and also just um, having more availability to access some resources, you know, resources, resources, resources. At the end of the day, what is in one community is not in the other and black and brown folk are disproportionately incarcerated and disproportionately misdiagnosed, given diagnoses of, uh, you know, schizoaffective in the early 2000s and just let people run roughshod where there's no accountability. And at, you know that comes down to where people are placing the importance on the money being spent. Are communities of color being um, provided diagnoses as a way to offset what's lacking there? Is that what's really happening? And um, you know, we just need to actually start calling for accountability for how money is actually spent and how crisis is actually um, handled. We need prevention, prevention, and we need actually a uh, diversion and we definitely need uh, to have no law enforcement contact um, where there is emotional crises. Um, we don't need to have unnecessary um, tragedies occur and um, we need to actually have culturally competent uh, persons task force on site and uh, make sure to know how to deescalate trauma and um, just uh, person-centered everything, just person-centered everything. So let's get some community out there and get some uh, challenges to what's happening. Um, thank you, Felix. All right, Akeem. Yeah, I, I love what Felix just said because it's the thought that we're doing something different. You know, we actually have uh, a lot of uh, resources that people have come up with in time. And I'm sure one thing that we could do is start listening to the youth. Uh, when we exclude them from the conversation, even though it's their generation, like their generation is gonna be the next generation um, that's ruling this uh, government and then so on and so forth. And so uh, when we exclude them from the conversation, we're, we're basically saying, we want you to do what uh, like our generation is doing as though it's working. And so it's, it, it's not, so that's like actually ridiculous to, to ponder that we're gonna just keep on doing what, you're, what my ancestors have been doing, uh, or, or not my ancestors, but the prior generation is doing. So I like what uh, Felix said. However, we also, like I said, right now we have um, different uh, ways of educating, uh, but we, in the Department of Education, we only choose two ways to educate. Yet there are seven different ways of learning. And so um, that's one thing. We don't have good edu education uh, prev uh, uh, specifically for our black and brown communities or poor communities of color or even of white. Like we just, they don't provide it. So they're basically saying, well, we do need uh, you to be in the, these positions, in destitute positions, in uh, helpless positions. Uh, it's, I think, move further away from government. I think the more control they had on us as they started implementing themselves into our families um, and telling us how to run our families or what we can and cannot do uh, was, the, was another step of them being inside your home inside your communities. Police are supposed to be on the, on the back, uh, on the outskirts of your community. And when you're needed, then come in. Not just walk around and intimidate because you're the only ones, like in New York, you're the only ones with the guns. Or technically to walk around with guns, you're the only ones that's allowed to. That's intimidating for people. Um, also, we don't get proper food, uh, food sourcing. Like we, we don't get adequate uh, or healthy food sources. We, we, Felix said it the best, resources, resources, resources. And you know what? If we get rid of resources and get out of this paper money system, then what would that look like? We, we don't even know because we're not even trying to, uh, uh, to progress into anything different. We're stuck, we're staying stuck because the powers that be 
want us to be where we are. And so I only brought up that we have other, uh, other ways because my, my birth mom, uh, who works in the Dalton in Manhattan, which is a wealthy privileged school where Tom Cruise has his kids and Common and all these other like uh, celebrity kids have it. And I look at what she's doing in their schools and no wonder these kids are like almost like borderline geniuses because they're not, they're not doing the same learning as kids in, uh, actually they're very privileged, but it's privilege and opportunity. Where there's privilege and opportunity, there's chance for growth and success. And when there's not, well, take your chances. Like uh, we're, we're really just keep on, uh, keep on doing the same thing over and over. So we have to be living in an insane society or in the same uh, insane uh, culture. Thank you, Akeem. All right, Asa. Um, I, being mindful of time, I wanted to take a moment to quickly plug a really fantastic organization, the Black Emotional and Mental Health Collective, Being Collective, um, that is run by uh, Yolo Akili Robinson. I will drop his name in the chat as well. Um, they kind of approach this work from the same uh, understanding of justice-based work, but also advancing alternative models for communal healing and care um, grounded in the principles of healing justice and disability justice. So I just wanted to shout them out because in the midst of the COVID crisis, they have really mobilized across the South um, to ensure that Black people have access to these kind of um, have access to these kinds of supports, communal supports at a time where uh, our access to our typical support systems have been interrupted in many ways. And they're also mobilizing um, mutual aid programs throughout the South and providing um, cash just to people who need it to get by. So I just wanted to quickly plug them as well. Thank you. And finally, Leah. Thank you. Uh, two quick plugs to add on. Speaking of films, I would like to recommend the film Beyond Possible, how the Hearing Voices Movement transforms lives, uh, created by the Western Mass uh, Recovery Learning Community, a collaboration with Mount Holyoke College and um, funded by Open Excellence. So um, we really recommend that 22 minute doc. Uh, you can find it and we'll, we'll share uh, this link in the resources. Uh, I believe it is uh, Beyond Possible film.info, but we will get that for you. Uh, and then uh, We the Unhoused podcast uh, by uh, Theo Henderson. I, we also add that resource. This is an unhoused um, person uh, fighting, uh, you know, in LA for housing justice, uplifting the voices of unhoused people in LA like this film could not dream of. And um, definitely recommend We the Unhoused. Uh, and I think also just lastly wanted to uplift and we'll add this um, poor magazine and all of the uh, associated media uh, led uh, by poor people, indigenous people. Um, it's a grassroots nonprofit arts organization. So definitely encourage y'all to uh, connect. Um, and can I just 30 seconds? Do it. 30, I, quick, quick, quick. We've developed, we're developing a people's policy platform as an alternative to the coercive policy platform of these folks that we've been talking about. Been working with several comrades on this. We're updating it for COVID, but everything we were saying about what communities of care look like before COVID holds just even more true. So please stay tuned for more on that. Uh, we're gonna definitely be putting out uh, more to come. So thank you. All right, so look, I just wanna, I just wanna say that I've moderated a, you know, a number of panels in my life, but this was really, this was an, I feel so honored to be just like with you all right now. I just feel like, like what we're doing, there's like some transmuting process of, even though we're just a small little webinar, this thing is going to go out there into the world um, and we're doing it together. Um, and I want to say, as we're wrapping up that we didn't mention it at the beginning, but um, we wrote that public note to PBS and they actually responded to us. They actually responded to us and the, and the, the director of the film um, like signed his name on it. And what they said, they didn't say much of substance and they didn't actually take us seriously about like creating a public forum for doing things. But they said, look, apply for, apply for funding from us to make your own film. And what, I thought that that was like, you know, that's like, we, we don't have, we have a lot going on. We're not going to make our own film, but 
we know people who make films and it's probably something to think about. I mean, there's like, it, it would be this, like this perspective that we're getting here tonight, this would, this would make an incredible film. Um, so that's what I got to say. We're right at the end. I'm going to pass it to Pauline. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been such an honor. Right. Yes, Pauline, she, her, hers. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm, I know we're sending a lot of links and we're putting them in the chat. We're going to make sure that you get all these in an email. Um, I wanted to highlight a few upcoming events that we have. So one, there's a link to Screen Bedlam. It's free for the next two days. Um, um, there, there is a little bit of a trigger warning with this film. This is why we have this conversation. So that link is there so that you can use. Um, we have upcoming trainings. We are the Institute for the Development of the Human Arts. And um, we are actually launching a new training by Sasha called Dangerous Gifts in a week from today. Um, but there's a lot of really great trainings already on there as well. Um, and then our next IDA community event is going to be our um, IDA community open mic, which is going to be happening on the 25th. Everyone is welcome to submit to participate. This is one way that we build power to shift that narrative, to build our collective analysis when we engage with one another in cultural arts practices. I wanted to lift up that this kind of practice was something that I learned from the people, my friends at the People's Forum, which is an amazing movement incubator here uh, in, uh, uh, in New York. Um, and then also um, some practices that I learned from other members of IDA and our board members. Um, and then also, I just want to plug that the featured music, um, uh, again, with Keisha Soleil and the Peace Poets, please check them out. They're wonderful artists to stay in touch with. We thank you all so much for joining us. Any questions, please make sure that you email us. We will send a follow-up email. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. Thank you. All right. All right. Have a good night, y'all. Good night. Take care. Thanks, Saza. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, oh, yeah. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Really. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.